don't think any of us know all the answers to the future. Any of us know uh, what are all the solutions to the problems that affect our particular country or affect the world. But at least to keep challenging, at least to keep looking for solutions. That's what youth is. That's the challenge of youth. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Board Chair Keith Carroll. Good evening. Welcome to the 2017 Robert F. Kennedy Children's Action Corps Embracing the Legacy Awards Dinner. What a great night to celebrate the living legacy of Bobby Kennedy, carried out through the important work being done not only by our three honorees tonight, who are all very deserving of the award they're going to receive tonight, but I also want to point out the dedicated staff of the Robert F. Kennedy Children's Action Corps. I stand up here tonight as the board chair of this great agency, but truth be told, it is the senior leadership, clinicians, and social workers of this great agency who are the true heroes and champions of Bobby Kennedy's legacy. And I would just like to take a moment to ask those staff members who are here in the audience tonight to please stand up and be recognized. Now, on behalf of our board and our event committee, I am thrilled to announce that with a little help from all of you, we have reached our pre-dinner goal of $280,000. Tepid, tepid applause for that, because we're not done. With a little more help from you later, and you'll be hearing from our great friend Susan Warren, again, a former award winner this award, um, we can go even higher. So more on that later. Since the creation of this award in 2006, we have been delighted to honor those who share a passion for creating a better future for youth in the spirit of Robert F. Kennedy's belief that the ability of a single person can make a difference in the world. Tonight we pay tribute to three individuals who have made such a difference. This year's honorees, Bill Little, Susan Taylor, and Donato Tremuto are shining examples of exactly what this award should be handed out for. We look forward to celebrating all of our honorees' accomplishments and the great work of the Robert F. Kennedy Children's Action Corps this evening. Now, an evening honoring the legacy of Robert F. Kennedy in the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum would not be proper or complete without the participation of the Kennedy family. Fortunately for us, we have Matt Kennedy and his brother Congressman Joe Kennedy with us here tonight. Not only are they board members, not only are they board members of this agency, they are both staunch advocates for the children our agency serves. And the involvement of the Kennedys is not something that they need to do, it's something that they want to do, and it's endemic to their core, and we are thankful for their involvement and their leadership for our board. So, so my job as board chair um, is to start this evening and to introduce Joe. And as I sit here introducing Joe, I look down and I see Susan Wernick down here throwing daggers at me. because. Susan used to have the role of introducing Joe, and we would all hear about their, their prior life as a dating couple. Um, <laughs> Joe and I haven't dated. <laughs> However, it is my distinct... Yes. Yeah. <laughs> He's my congressman. Um, no, I will say that it is my distinct honor and privilege to introduce my fellow board member, the co-chair of tonight's dinner, and my good friend, Joe Kennedy. That's not your typical introduction. Um, <laughs> Keith, thank you. Um, 
thank you for uh, your leadership. Thank you for um, your willingness to commit to being chair of this board. Um, thank you for your long time engagement and investment in this organization. Um, we are grateful to have you here. We're grateful to have your, your hand at the helm um, at this moment for this agency and given the, the times that we are in. So thank you and, and certainly congrats on all that you did to make it tonight a success. <clears throat> a couple of other quick thank yous um, to Mr. Boyle and Mr. Garrity. Um, gentlemen, congratulations on um, all that you have done to once again fill this room with um, friends, with family members, with colleagues, with associates, with knowing you, a couple of folks that you dragged off the street and still somehow found a way to get them to donate to the, back to this organization. Um, it is an extraordinary testament to you both uh, that this hall is full um, and that uh, so many people here will be able to hear about the work that RFK Children's Action Corps does. Um, grateful for your commitment and thank you for what you guys did tonight. Grateful. <clears throat> Finally, I just want to echo a huge thanks um, from the bottom of my heart to the RFK staff. Um, I have um, visited obviously a number of facilities over the course of the past several years. I've gotten to know many of you. Um, I've said the joke every time. It ain't great, but I'm gonna keep using it. Ed's been doing this longer than I've been alive. Um, <laughs> He's been as dedicated to this uh, and to our kids um, as any person um, across this country. We are grateful for it to have you. Thank you for making this agency what it is today. <laughs> so I am, um, to say that I'm happy and, and thrilled and, and honored to be with all of you tonight, is um, not just an understatement. Um, but after the week that we all went through, um, the day that um, I witnessed yesterday in Washington, um, I'm not sure you can imagine how good it feels for me to be home. Um, <laughs> yes. When Congress isn't in session, there's only so much damage we can do. Um, <laughs> but on a serious note, um, not just to be home, but to be here. And to be here with all of you at an event like we share tonight with a community that finds strength in a common cause, that rallies together for those who are most in need, that works day and night to defend our country's better angels. To be with you in your faith and in your fight. And to know that it does Robert F. Kennedy's legacy such justice. The individuals we recognize tonight for their contribution do as well. To Bill Little, who spent the last 45 years longer than, me. Longer than Ed, <laughs> and far longer than Matt and I have both been alive, <laughs> almost combined. 45 years of seeking social justice for adolescents that our country, our society has left behind. Those caught in child welfare and the juvenile justice system and our mental health system across our nation. Susan Taylor, who through her distinguished career in journalism and her work as founder and CEO of National Cares Mentoring Movement, has helped drive social and juvenile justice efforts across our nation. Donato Tremuto, where are you? Right up front. Who ins was inspired by Robert Kennedy's dedication to human rights and has launched companies that provide state-of-the-art mobile health technology to medical professionals in remote, remote areas in Africa, 
in India and Haiti, and to establish the Tremuto Foundation to provide resources to organizations that share in his vision and his mission of helping those in need. Ladies and gentlemen, at a moment when a dark pessimism has come down around our most sacred institutions. You have public servants like Bill, like Susan, like Donato, who show us a way forward, who serve as a guiding light. They treat each child, each parent, each neighbor, each stranger with the dignity and decency we all deserve. They see suffering and struggle not as individual weakness, but as our common humanity. They know that strength comes not just from muscle and might, but also from mercy and grace. And it's a lesson that every corner of our country can take to heart. I am humbled to help recognize their accomplishments tonight. And recognizing that maybe you've heard enough from politicians this past week, <laughs> happy to see the stage quickly. Um, to a dear friend, to an advocate, to a tireless champion, to an award winner herself, to uh, somebody that has used her commitment, her platform, uh, to highlight some of those better angels and to demand better of all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, please, not done yet, Susan. Um, <laughs> please welcome Susan Warnick. Thank you and good night. Okay, who wants to follow Congressman Kennedy? Am I right? Let me just say one thing. I want to say a couple of things. Congressman Kennedy, you have become one of the most important voices in this country, and we thank you. And now it's time for an annual tradition. I have stood at this podium many years, and I have said, long before Joe even ran for Congress, I have to say, that this is a guy who's got his heart in the right place, and this is a guy who knows what's important, and this is a guy who's going to stand up for all of us, and he's going to do it. And one day, we are going to vote for him for president, and hopefully that day will be sooner than some of us thought. And when that day comes, we are all going to say we knew him when he was great and he was smart and he was already doing the important work. And I am going to say I dated him. Welcome, everybody, and thank you so much for coming tonight. A huge congratulations to our amazing award winners and to um, all of you for taking the time to be a part of this night, and you will understand why it is so important as we go through the evening. I have a very unique perspective on the RFK Children's Action Corps because I have been um, honored uh, to be a past recipient of this award, but also because I have worked with the amazing staff at RFK for the better part of the last 30 some odd years. And so I can stand here and I can tell you that as the staff stands to be honored, th these are not people who just got these jobs a couple of years, ladies, uh, years ago, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you know, and I'm proud to be sitting next to Alan Klein tonight who um, has had the job for going on 34 years. I mean, amazing. And Terry Shanley in the back, sitting over there. Tanley, Terry is also not far behind Alan. And, and I, was, I, I was privileged to work with these guys within the agency. How, you ask? Um, because back in the early 80s, when I first started at WCVB-TV, from which I have now been retired for a few years, um, 
my assignment was to do a series on teenage prostitution in Boston. And I thought, teenage prostitution in Boston? How can that possibly be? We're a civilized city. This can't be happening. Well, I found out it was. And I found and met young women who were victims of abuse in a way that you just can't imagine. And so I reported, that, and these women were, were, these young women were, were, were fearless. I mean, they helped me do the story. They knew it was important to get it out because they knew they wanted to better their, themselves and their circumstances, and they just didn't know what to do. And, and, and when my stories were over, I thought, I can't just walk away from this now. I, I can't just pretend like, okay, I did these stories and now it's over. I wanted to do more. And so I went to what was then the Department of Youth Services and the late and great Commissioner Ned Loughran, who unfortunately we last, lost within the last year, who was a man before his time and committed to children everywhere. And I said, Commissioner, you don't really know me. I'm a reporter on television, but I want to volunteer in one of your programs. And he said, OK. And he actually let me, he trusted me enough to let me go into what was then the Rotenberg School. And I went every week and I got to meet amazing young women. And I got to act as a, hopefully as a role model. But I got to see the inside of the RFK Children's Action Corps. I got to see the staff. I got to see how it works. And ladies and gentlemen, these are people who have dedicated their lives to saving and helping our youth. And so I am so honored to be here with all of you in behalf of the staff. And I just would love to give it up for them one more time. You all have these little things. You may have noticed them. And, and from time to time, there's a slide behind me, too. They look like little toys. And you might be, oh, these are cute little party favors. Isn't that sort of a nice little touch tonight? Um, let me just tell you what they are. They, they're used in the programs to help some of our kids feel, to actually feel, and in many cases these are kids who have not allowed themselves to feel, to pull, to squeeze, to get out emotion that in other ways and, and they just couldn't do. So we wanted you all to actually feel free to play with them while we're, while, we're, while we're progressing through the evening because you will get a sense of just one of the remarkable ways we touch. This is how we touch. And we hope that you will all be touched tonight and become a part of what we do every day, which is save and improve the, life, the lives of children. Uh, we have a tribute tonight to our honorees. It is in a beautiful form. And to help with this tribute, it's my honor to introduce two very talented young people, Amanda Rosa and Ryan Murray to help with our tribute.
And gentlemen, were they amazing? Come on, girls, come on, come on, come on, come right back, come on. Just one more bow, come on. You were wonderful, you were wonderful, come on. Come on up, just come up. Their CDs are in the lobby, 1999. Now you guys were great. Thank you so much. Um, our next speaker tonight is another man who has dedicated so much of his love and his life and his family and his hours and done so much for the RFK Children's Action Corps. So as we bring him up to the podium, up to the stage, please let's not only welcome him tonight, but help me to thank the Vice Chair of the Board of Directors as well as the Co-Chair of this evening's event, Jim Garrity. Thank you. It is a great honor that I present this evening's award to William Little. For the last 45 years, he has devoted his career to seeking social justice for adolescents involved with the Massachusetts and Rhode Island child welfare, juvenile justice, and mental health systems. Since 1979, Bill has served as the president of the key program under his leadership, it has increased its revenues tenfold and has become a multi-state organization and a behavioral health services to over 700 youth and families every day. In addition to his impressive accomplishments at Key, he has also held leadership roles with many organizations, leading to significant change to public policy, pol positively affecting youth and families. Bill is a founding member of the Citizens for Juvenile Justice, the only independent nonprofit statewide organization 
working exclusively to improve the juvenile justice system in Massachusetts. He is also the founding member of the Rhode Island Coalition for Children and Families and has served as the president of, of the Massachusetts Council for Human Services, chairperson of the Children's League of Massachusetts, and chairperson of the trustees of Worcester State College. A lifelong advocate for children, Bill is a true example of the work that the legacy of Robert F. Kennedy represents. And his passion and determination will have significant impact for years to come. It is my pleasure to welcome him to this stage to accept the 2017 Embracing the Legacy Award. Bill? Thank you very much. That was a uh, great introduction that I wrote. What you guys all think, right? It's nice to write about yourself. The, um, and also, I want to say a lot of those photos, uh, there was my lovely wife Janice with her date that night, Mark Wahlberg. So I don't think that, uh, the, the truth is she wanted to be cropped out of the picture, but uh, we, we will let her do it. But thank, thank you very much, Jim, for the kind introduction. When Ed Kelly, who was the CF, CFO, no, excuse me, CEO of uh, RFK Action Corps called to inform me that I was uh, selected to be one of the recipients. I was certainly extremely honored and excited, enthusiastic, and still am. It's, uh, it's a tremendous award, but, uh, the capstone of my career. Um, I have to say that I have known Ed and worked with Ed for over 40 years, and without a doubt, I can say this, that nominating me was the best decision Ed has ever made. So, <laughs> thank, so thanks, Ed. Thank you, Ed. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, I want to just talk a little bit about my history. Uh, throughout my college years, as an undergraduate at Boston University, I was not certain about my career direction. However, during those years, I was continually impressed by the commitment to social justice demonstrated by JFK, RFK, Ted Kennedy, and other Kennedy family members, whether that be their leadership in civil rights or founding in Special Olympics. I was particularly drawn to RFK's dedication to children. As an undergrad, I was offered a work-study job uh, at the Brockton YMCA, where I first began to work with kids as a lifeguard, a camp counselor, supervising in the gym. My brother Bob, my, my uh, younger brother Bob, uh, was a, this will come out as a joke later, uh, my younger brother Bob, maybe, my younger brother Bob um, was a school teacher, so I thought it, uh, I would enjoy being a school teacher also. So I did a lot of substitute school teaching, but quickly realized actually that I was not a very good teacher. Um, so I said, I'm not gonna be a teacher, but I loved, I really loved interacting with kids. Um, it was just a passion I had, it was, it was tremendous. Um, so while at the YMCA, the Massachusetts Department of uh, Youth Services had a detention program for 25 kids. And I applied to be a residential shift worker and was hired and my career started. I worked for DYS for about three years in various positions of increased responsibility. And through my work at DYS, I met the founder of the key program, Bill Wolf, uh, who in 1975 offered me a job to be what was supposed to be a director of operations, which was kind of a new position for the agency. Um, I had two mentors at, at uh, DYS, uh, a fellow by the name of Jack Kelly, and another gentleman by the name of Frank, Frank Masciarelli, who uh, unfortunately is not with us any longer. But I turned to them and said, well, what do you think? Should I leave the state where I did feel comfortable in the position they had, or should I take a chance and leave and go to work for a private nonprofit? Um, I chose to go to work for the no private nonprofit, and as been said, it's been uh, 43 years later. In 1978, Bill Wolf left to go back to the Kennedy School of Government and said he uh, had no intention of coming back to Key. He was uh, moving on to uh, other things in his career. Um, so when he left, uh, I became the executive director. I think I was 26 years old at the time. The point of this brief employment history is that it was RFK's dedication to children that guided me to my career. Now, no matter what one's profession, one needs the support and the guidance to succeed. 
We all need guidance, advice, and encouragement. Professionally, I've had the support and the hard work of the, um, of the, the staff at Key, who do the day-to-day -day work with kids every single day. I don't work directly with the kids anymore, but they do all the hard work. And I, some of them are here tonight. There's Wes Cotter, Mike Goodwin, Cindy Hay, Ron Ardeen, Kelly Farrier, Sue Spitali, Mike Brennan. I think most of them are here. Uh, Pat St. Germain, Scott Brum, Susanna Velasquez, Pat St. Germain, uh, and Kim, I'm going to say it right, Kim, Lunden. Am I close? <laughs> but anyway. Um, but if I would ask you, all the folks here from Key, all the people here from Key, please stand up so we can recognize you for the tremendous work you do. So please stand up. You can sit down now. Um, yeah. uh, they're the very, very best in our field. They're dedicated professionals. Um, I love them all dearly. They're just uh, tremendous to work with. So thank you all very much. I also have the continued direction and guidance of Key's Board of Directors, and they're represented here tonight by Ed Feldstein, our long-standing chairperson, Joan Briani, <laughs> Susan Luz, um, Again, they're heavily invested in the organization, really, really, truly believe in our mission, and have always supported me and the staff and all the work that we've done. So thank you all very much. It's much appreciated. Um, okay, page seven. No. Uh, I know, three to five minutes, I'm working on it. But, uh, along with the key staff and board, I have also had access to the expertise and advice of respected leaders in the field, such as Joe Levy, Jerry Wright, Michael Weeks, Ed Kelly. I'm sorry, Ed, I had to say it. No, Ed Kelly is tremendous. Um, and uh, there's two newcomers, Aaron Bradley, who's the head of the Children's League of Massachusetts, and Naoka Carey, I know, is here, who is the uh, executive director of Citizens for Juvenile Justice. So thank you all for uh, your great support. Also, I'm sorry, Andy Pond. I, I can't leave out Andy. Andy is a guy I call up all the time and seek advice and have discussions with, so thank you. And I have to say, lastly, in terms of support, I've had great support from our state partners, from the Department of Children's Families, Department of Youth Services, Department of Mental Health. Uh, they're just as committed as all of us who run nonprofits are to um, ensuring that kids and families here in Massachusetts receive the best possible care that they can. Um, and personally, I've always had the unqualified support of my family. My older brother Brad is here tonight. The joke is he's uh, older, not as good looking, and not as smart as I am. Uh, but none of those are true because he's younger. Um, and the most important person in my life is here tonight, obviously, with me, my lovely wife, Janice. We were married 43 years yesterday. Um, I will always, uh, always, always and forever love Jan. So Jan, please stand up and let people, come on. Thank you. So I do accept this uh, embracing RFK, embracing the Legacy Award on behalf of all those who have personally and professionally supported me. So thank you, everybody. All of us, um, you can clap as much as you like, but don't if, no. Um, I lost my train of thought. No, no. All of, us are providing, all of us providing service to kids and families today are facing a particular challenge, and that is our workforce. While the need continues to grow for services, we face a significant workforce shortage. I want to urge each of you tonight to encourage your own children and those children of your friends, and I hope you have many friends, and your coworkers to follow the legacy of RFK of public service to others. Our Commonwealth is a whole body of people who need to continue to act as one and a care for our youth. One of the things that Key has done to support staff is back in, um, I think it was back in 2004, we had set up another, uh, another nonprofit back in 1988 called the Alternatives for Youth Foundation. And in 2004, we started granting scholarships to young men and women who were interested in pursuing a career, a master's in social work. And we gave them scholarships every year. Since we started that program, we have awarded 312 scholarships 
for, for since 2004 for a value of $1.3 million. So the Alternative for Youth Foundation. I'm sorry, you know what, I actually, I didn't name, I mean, left out what I want to say. The scholarship's name is the uh, Deborah Feldstein Botfeld Scholarship. It's in the honor of a young woman who passed away at a very young age, was a committed social worker. So that particular um, scholarship, the one I just mentioned, is in uh, her memory. So again, it's been a great day. And we also started a scholarship, um, another scholarship out of the Alternative to Youth Foundation called the William J. Wolf Scholarship. And the uh, memory, not the memory, excuse me. <laughs> Sorry, Ed, huh? Jeez. I think he's still alive last time I talked to him. Uh, oh, hey, I made a mistake. What can you do? <laughs> uh, was, hey. Bill, God bless you. No. <laughs> We started a scholarship in his, um, in his name for kids who have gone through key. Um, and since 1998, uh, we have awarded to kids who have gone through key 425 scholarships totaling $1.65 million. So we've been fortunate enough, we've been fortunate enough to have these scholarships. We've been fortunate enough to have the uh, board endorse and support those scholarships. Um, so. Um, just like all of us here tonight, the kids and families we work with need what each one of us needs. They need to be treated with respect. They need to be treated with dignity. They need to be treated equally. They need educational opportunity. They all need to feel good about who they are, just like us. And they need to be loved and to love somebody. So those kids that we all work with are no different than anybody here in this room. Um, at some point soon, all the kids we work with will grow up to be adults. They will take care of their own families, and we rely upon them to care for those who live in our communities. Each of us here tonight is obligated to make sure that we provide them with every possible opportunity to succeed. I would like to close with a quote from R.F. Kennedy that's actually on uh, Ed's website, R.F.K. Children's website. Justice, dignity, equality. These are words which are often used loosely with little appreciation of their meaning. I think that their meaning can be distilled into one goal, that every child in this country live as we would want our own children to live. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Bill. And Janice, 43 years. Wow. I can add all mine together, and I don't even come anywhere close to it. <laughs> so we have a record number of people in the, in the room tonight, more than 300. So we thought now might be a really good time to go around the room and ask each of you to stand and say a little something about yourselves. <laughs> Actually, dinner will be served momentarily, folks. Enjoy dinner, and we will see you afterwards for the rest of our program. Thank you so much. You may remember me from before dinner. Uh, we have some other amazing people that we would like to honor tonight, and we want you to meet them. But the next person on our agenda is special for many reasons. Any opportunity that I have to introduce him is an honor. And I can never find the right words because there just aren't enough. There aren't enough adjectives to describe his love. There are not, there's not enough sentiment to talk about this man's heart. The commitment, the challenges that he has faced, and the selfless way he has addressed so many issues. He is brilliant, he is caring, he is loving, and he could have gone to work for any number 
of corporations in this country and probably made a fortune, but he did not. For the last nearly 40 years, he has chosen to be an advocate for the children who need him the most. We talk so much about the RFK Action, Children's Action Corps and what amazing work they do and a staff that is so dedicated and loving. And as you know, you don't need me to tell you, it starts at the top. And so as I bring him to the stage, please know that there will never be a way that we will be able to say thank you enough sufficiently to a guy who deserves more than we can ever give him, the CEO of the RFK Children's Action Corps, Mr. Ed Kelly. The first thing that I want to do is thank Bill Little. For, I don't think I have to worry about a lawsuit after having at, in, at, the, at the microphone tonight. Everyone said, are you crazy? You're going to let Bill Little have a microphone at, a, at the Kennedy Library? So Bill, thank you very much. I'm not anticipating a lawsuit, so I, I'm really very helpful. And by the way, congratulations. Congratulations. So I have this prepared statement that I'm not going to follow which will not shock my staff, um, because I've been touched by some of the remarks that have been said earlier. But the first thing I do want to do is, Bill, congratulations, and uh, you so much deserve this honor for the, all those years of service. I, I was on uh, NECN yesterday. They were kind enough to broadcast, and I said, Bill may be the only CEO older than me <laughs> in, in the system. And I think it might be true, Bill. You know? And you are better looking, there's no doubt about it. And Susan, the work, the dedication, overtime, so energetic, so selfless. Uh, I just can't tell you how much I admire uh, the work that you've done and, uh, uh, and continue to do. Uh, did your, your energy, your vision, your vitality is absolutely fabulous. And so, we're so honored. Donato, um, you shared with us uh, your overcoming a, an early childhood handicap and how that actually made you stronger. And I know that you've written a book about that. Uh, and I think that that book is something probably every one of our children should read. That uh, out of adversity and out of difficulty, out of challenge comes strength and success. So, uh, and I think you bring that every day to the people that you work with and the companies that, that you have founded and so forth. And you're an ins inspiration to all of us. So thank you again. And you so much deserve this honor this evening. It's my uh, responsibility to say thank you to some folks in the room. I'll, I'll move through it quickly. I don't know if you saw them, but uh, Senate President Rosenberg was here earlier. Uh, Commissioner Forbes was here a little bit earlier. We were delighted they both had to leave. I thank them for being here. Uh, Nakoa Kerry is here from CFJJ. Uh, Bill and I are founding board members of that organization, very important organization here in Massachusetts. Erin Bradley is here from uh, the Children's League, uh, one of the leading organizations that, that got chins reform through for uh, uh, our children. So there's a, in this room, there's a world of, uh, of child welfare and advocates and people that are passionate about the work the same way that we are. And I thank them all for being here. And if I've missed somebody, which I probably have, I deeply apologize. One other person I'd like to say, I'd like to stand up for a second, is Vin McCarthy. Uh, Vin, I got lights on here in front of me. I can't see you, but and Vin is one of the founding um, Vin took a phone call from Phil Johnston over 48 years ago as a young lawyer at Hill and Door and really actually wrote the Articles of Incorporation for RFK. And I remember Vin's interview of me vividly in 1981. So Vin, thank you so much for being here and for everything. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So the children that we work with deserve a childhood. They deserve to be able to 
uh, feel safe at night, to be able to go out and play baseball during the day, uh, one of them little spinny things that uh, you're not allowed to bring to school and things that I can't figure out from my own grandchildren. And they denied that. They simply denied it. Because they live a life that is full of uncertainty and trauma. And uh, we have children that are placed with us. Some of them have been in a dozen foster care placements in the last two years. So in, in our annual report, you'll, if you read our letter, you'll see that we call for a review of child welfare and a review of, ju of juvenile justice from the point of view of what one of our board members say, the well-being of the child. We, it needs to stop being a system and it needs to be a, um, a process where families are kept together and when that's not possible, children are placed in other placements that, that take care of their overwhelming, their overall well-being. Here's a comparison that I make. The Defense Department can spend five, million, five billion dollars to develop a new rocket. And that takes seven or eight years. And then that rocket, as we saw, costs a million dollars a piece as they're fired off of, of, of these, um, these aircraft carriers and so forth. So we make these long-term uh, commitments to war. And, they, we, and that carries over two or three administrations and so on and so forth. Then why can't we take a 12-year-old foster child and make a 10-year commitment to them so that they live a healthy life and, by the way, become a taxpayer. It just doesn't make sense. There's, there's just no common sense in the system. And it needs to be looked at for precisely that. And at my age and with my experience and with nothing to lose, I want to call it out. The system is broken and it needs to be fixed once and for all. I asked uh, the congressman before I, I came up about the, this, the budget. I, I serve on the board of the uh, Child Welfare League of America and therefore I receive briefings on the, what's going on on Capitol Hill in terms of um, what is um, what this budget looks like, what the different pieces look like coming out of the federal govern government. And devastating is an understatement to what our children can expect in terms of their services. So that means two things to me as the CEO of this organization. It means number one, uh, thank God for Congressman Kennedy and others like him in, 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 the, uh, in the Congress and, and in the Senate that are fighting for these children. And that, that, absolutely needs to, that absolutely needs to continue. But it also means, for one of the very first times in my career, I have to turn to this group of people that are here, that are friends and family, and say, we need your help. And when I say we need your help, it's not like you can work a shift at a program. It's not like you can get a degree in counseling or something like that. The way you can help is with resources. And when I say resources, I'm talking about financially supporting the work of this agency to survive what I think is going to be the biggest financial crisis that we have faced since I've stood in this position. And I don't think I'm understating this a single bit, that every agency, key is going to need its supporters, RFK is going to need its su supporters, JRI is going to need their supporters to survive to be able to take care of the ch the, these children. This is a very, very dark cloud on the horizon. So um, let me give you a quote that has become one of my favorites of, of Robert Kennedy. We develop the kind of citizens we deserve. If a large number of our children grow up in frustration and poverty, we must expect to pay the price. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. So that deserves an applause. If I just heard a clap, that absolutely deserves All those years ago, for that man to have that vision and to speak that way so clearly is very, very important. On a more part, and I don't mean to bring, bring gloom to this, but it's, unfortunately, it's the reality of the situation that's facing every vulnerable child in, in our country as we speak. So on a much more positive note, I want to celebrate the work 
that is done by our staff and our children. And we're going to highlight to you some of the work of our children. And before we do that, I want, you to, be, I want to be certain that you understand that while we're very proud of the way we work with our children, and we're very proud when we're able to highlight and have you meet them and see that they've been successful, they're truly the architects of their own success. You know, we, we enable, we support, we guide, but they, it, it's their decisions, it's their success, and it's their lives, and that's what's most important of, of the, the entire piece. So I'd like to share with you the agency's video, and I'll be back with you in just a few minutes. Thanks. Some kids just need a second chance. My life before Robert F. Kennedy Children's Action Corps, skipping school and doing what I want to do, not listening to my mom. And then it led to like me and a group of friends decided to, you know, just do a crazy thing. And that led me to face some charges. The turning point was when I was assigned to staff from RFK. And I was hopeful because the curfew I had, they didn't give me time to hang out with friends. And I was only in contact with my, with my staff. And she always pushed me to do better in school and get home on time and help my mom in better ways. They really do care about each and every person and they do help every community they can and they just want to see every kid do better for themselves. I go home every day with telling my mom, oh, I did amazing in school, showing her great report cards. And she's always asking me, tell your RFK staff that I said thank you for making you such a better young man. I was like, they know I tell them every day. My hope for the future is I get, I get to double major in college, I get to graduate with two degrees, and my mom's there to watch, and then I can, she can finally have a smile on her face and know that one of her kids is succeeding in life. And then I want to start my career um, working for the youth justice system. Some kids need a school that understands their needs. I think the strength of our transition programming is that it's a highly individualized plan. It is, um, hopefully puts all the right supports in place for students, but at the end of the day, it's, it's ASHA's plan, and mm -hmm. it's driven by ASHA and largely built around ASHA skills. And so we feel pretty confident mm -hmm. that you're gonna be able to go on and work your plan as you go forward. I think five years ago, I wouldn't have thought any of this is possible. I didn't think that I was going to be able to pass the MCAS or even begin the transition team and go out in the world and know the skills. I think when I, five years ago, I was just done. I wasn't motivated and I didn't want to do the work. And five years later, I've done the work. And because of his school and their support, they don't let you fall. They support you and they tailor the support you need and they listen. The transition team has definitely shaped me into who I am and helped me learn to motivate myself and learn that my goals can be met with hard work and dedication. And it's okay to ask for help. We're not just a school, we're a family. It's been a remarkably welcoming environment. Um, not just the small classes, but the, the, the really like friendly commitment to the kids. The staff has taken the time to know us as a family. The last year or two with the transition program, the number of new things that the transition kids do, I mean, it's phenomenal. The folks here have managed to get Asha and, and the others you know, out of the building into the, into the world um, and feeling safe there. The things that Asha knows about the world, um, considering how reluctant she has always been to be a part of it. I, I, I attribute almost 100% to, to this school to, and, and these folks. Some kids need a forever family. I know that my girls have come a long way coming to our home from not being able to say a word without crying to being able to be sassy pants <laughs> um, 
it wasn't easy, but it's worth it. The smile that my children have on their face when they realize that they get to be part of our family forever, it makes my heart two sizes bigger. Karen was amazing. When she came into our home, she told us everything. She was very straightforward. She let us know. And she wanted to make sure that we were comfortable moving on. No sugar coating, which is great because it's not a subject to be sugar coated. Karen and Jody was very helpful with us, not with just us, but our biological children as well as the girls to make sure that we were comfortable moving forward. For any family looking to adopt or foster, the uh, RFK is, is a great agency to go with. They really want the best lives for their children. It, it's been an amazing opportunity to, to bring the girls into our family and to improve their lives. And they've improved our lives just as much, I think, as we've improved theirs. So our, it's a beautiful um, uh, film in Elmer, uh, Asher and her mom, and the Golden family are sitting here in the back. I'd like them to stand so that we can say hello to them. So, uh, and the, the reason the dad isn't here, by the way, from the Golden family is he's deployed, he's in Texas right now. So, um, uh, mom's got a lot to do. I, I, I actually joked with them earlier that if they adopted two more children, they would need a group home license. So, so you can see the work that we're trying to do and you can see the circumstances that, that unfortunately we're, we're trying to work under. And um, we've learned uh, that uh, uh, about a month ago, members of the Board of Directors went to our Leadership Institute retreat and we actually had small groups where board members sat with staff directly without middle management staff uh, in, in, the, in the room and got to hear firsthand from staff what it was like to work under these conditions. And again, I'm going to give you a, a, a little bit of data. A, a, a single mother of two who makes $34,000 a year qualifies for food stamps in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Our starting salary is $26,000. And if you get promoted, you get a $2,000 raise. The system really needs to be looked at for what it is, and it needs to be fixed once and for all. Because the real priority here isn't the staff, it's the way we take care of the children. That's the real issue. So. And there's no other way for me to share that with you, better way for me to share that with you. I always say that when you're the CEO, you're a talking tie. And in, in an event like this, everybody expects the CEO to get up and say something like what I'm saying right now. But I'd like you to hear from Jasmine, one of our, one of our uh, student alumni, and I'd like her to come up and join me here on the stage. Jasmine. I saw her a minute ago. Sorry, I was Snapchatting everyone. <laughs> okay, my name is Jasmine, and I am going to share my story with you all today. I hope um, you guys get to know me. Um, as I've gotten to know some of you. I'm a little nervous, <laughs> but all right. There is an African proverb that says, it takes a village to raise a child. Well, look around people. Robert F. Kennedy Children's Action Corps is that village. I am proud to say that I have been involved with RFK for over 10 years now from being a part of the program to working with them. One thing that I've learned that is guaranteed is children will make many mistakes. 
But another thing that is guaranteed is not all get a second chance. Fortunately for me, I faced the same issues, but RFK was there to give me a second chance. As a child, I had struggled, made some mistakes, but learned from them with the help of RFK's DDAP program. When I was younger, I got into an altercation with another young lady that landed both of us in front of a judge. At that moment is when I started to lose hope. My life could have gone either way. I was fortunate to have Judge Harris recognize my circumstances and my potential and knew RFK would be what I needed. And from then on, my life has been on the right path. And also, I want to thank Judge Harris, who I know is here this evening. I want to thank you again. <laughs> it has been truly a blessing to have met him, um, to know his everything that he has done for not just me, but for other children in my position. The dedication, the effort, the patience, the compassion, and the love that I received quickly made me realize I knew I was in good hands at RFK. One common issue I faced growing up, which I see in today's youth, is dealing with lack of hope. We didn't have hope because of the unfortunate predicaments we were in or had experienced. Amongst the losses of hope, we've had, amongst the loss of hope, we've had to deal with many other losses, such as confidence, trust, opportunities, and the loss of family and friends. We have been subjected to being abused, mistreated, misguided, most of the time due to mistake or a poor decision by hanging out with the wrong crowd or simply ending up in the wrong place at the wrong time. That's why I appreciate RFK. Not only did they help me restore the broken pieces in my life, but they supported me every step of the way. What made RFK stand out to me was they understood me and treated me like an individual with respect. And I believe I can always count on RFK no matter where I'm at in my life's journey. And at this time, I am happy to say that I am a proud mother of two. <laughs> I have a six-year-old son and a one-year-old daughter. And I'm currently working as a dental assistant at BU with plans to um, go back to college uh, to obtain my paralegal certificate. <laughs> and then when I get rich, I can go to law school. <laughs> and I know there are um, other RFK alums in the audience who I feel uh, feel the same way as I do. And if I could just ask you all to stand, please. <laughs> yes, it is truly like a family. <laughs> On a final note, remember, children are our future. And what we do today for our children will make a difference for our world. Thank you. This is what we're talking about. tell you a little something, a little secret about Jasmine. I knew her almost 10 years ago. When I was a reporter at Channel 5, I'd heard about the DDAP program. And I said to Ed, who I knew very well, 
tell me about this program. Does it work? He says, yeah, I bet it works. I said, show me. He said, I'd like you to meet Jasmine. And so I met Jasmine. I met Jasmine as she was just starting the program. And I interviewed Judge Harris. And I did a story about it. Ladies and gentlemen, do you have any idea what it feels like to be here tonight and to see this young woman who's been through it, who's done it, who is living proof that this works? I mean, that's what we're doing here tonight. That's what we're doing. <laughs> Judge Harris, I love you. We all do. We all do. Also, by the way, Judge Harris is a past recipient of this amazing award. Our next speaker knows something about that because he gives so much of his time and so much of his money and so much of everything in his being. He is a board member. He's a co-chair of tonight's event. Give it up, please, for Mr. John Boyle. How about, how about give it up for Susan Warden? Uh, with a 75 or 70? I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I don't, it, it doesn't matter if you know anything about commercial real estate, you got a job at Cushman and Wakefield. I'll tell you that, I'll tell you right now, vice chairman of the company, you're hired. I mean, that's unbelievable. Wow. Wow. That is spectacular. Thank you, everyone. That was, um, that was really amazing. And I, on behalf of the board, um, appreciate everybody's uh, generosity. Hope everybody's having a good time. Um, it is with great admiration, truly, that I introduce our next honoree, a lifetime advocate uh, who is devoted to breaking the cycle of intergenerational poverty among uh, African Americans. Susan L. Taylor is committed to bringing together communities across the country to work strategically, peacefully, and passionately to help support and elevate impoverished young people and give them hope for a brighter future. Through her distinguished career in journalism and efforts as the founder and CEO of National Cares Mentoring Movement, she has been instrumental in having a nationwide impact on improving social and juvenile justice efforts across the United States of America. A fourth generation entrepreneur who grew up in Harlem Susan's vow to help children struggling in financially insecure families and unstable communities began when she was young, when she saw firsthand how the drug epidemic forced families to leave their community and the cycle of poverty that affected the single mothers left behind to raise their children. After founding her own cosmetic company at the age of 24, she was named beauty editor at Essence Magazine the publication she would shape into a world-renowned brand. During her 30 years as editor-in-chief, 30 years as editor-in-chief, she was seen as the most influential black woman in journalism. She celebrated the intelligence, creativity, and tenacity of black women. Her enterprising spirit and deep love for her community led to the founding of the National Cares Mentoring Movement in 2005 as Essence Cares. A community mobilization movement, National Cares is the only organization dedicated to providing mentoring and healing and wellness service, services for black children on a national level with local affiliates in nearly 60, 60 cities it has recruited and trained and deployed more than 140,000 mentors. 140,000 mentors to schools and youth support and mentoring organizations throughout the United States, dedicated to helping young children and people on the margin overcome the obstacles they face as demonstrated by her commitment and her passion displayed through her, week, her work, Susan is a champion for children and the African American community. On behalf of the RFK Children's Action Corps, I am very pleased and privileged 
to present her with the 2017 Embracing the Legacy Award. Thank you. Thank you for finding the National Cares Mentoring Movement and elevating our work and reaching out to me with your passion and compassion. You are extraordinary. It is so rare that I meet people who are outside of our race, who really understand the challenges that impoverished, marginalized black children face in the everyday of their lives. So it's my honor to be here tonight to receive this award and to receive it in the name of your grandfather, Robert Kennedy, who had the, had the honor of, of meeting when he was campaigning for the U.S. Senate in New York City. It was 1964, and a time when politicians could move through communities and shake people's hands, you know. I had just graduated from high school. It was an extraordinary moment. And I want to say that the, the love and the bold spirit that Robert Kennedy had for the black community, how he stood boldly for us in ways that too few people do even today, still just warm my heart. And so tonight, and Susan, you are an amazing, an amazing woman, a woman full of beauty and passion and grace tenacity and determination, and you got the money, girl. I'm proud of you. You did what you were supposed to do, you know? I'm happy tonight. I was hoping that, as you heard, we're in 58, nearly 60 cities in the United States, from San Diego up to Seattle, from Miami to Boston, Cambridge. And I was hoping that our leader would be here tonight, but she has two small children, and she's not here. But Margot Tyler is here, and I met her when she was working at the Gates Foundation. Thank you for being with me. I'm so joyful that my husband, Keffer Burns, is with me, because usually our paths take us to opposite ends of the nation. But tonight, I don't have to run home to you, because you're here with me. Now, I, there are some things that I want to say. I, I don't think I've, I've never done this before, but it's such an opportunity, because I'm in a state, Massachusetts, where there is a consciousness, or there was, about the pain of enslavement and poverty, a place where we know the abolitionist movement really got its footing. And because of those brave white folks and black folks who linked arms and aims for the benefit and freedom of African Americans and fought for it until it was won, you know, that led to our arrival. So my heart is filled with gratitude. And I thought that tonight I just wanted to frame and just do it very quickly before you see a quick video and I take my seat, why African Americans are struggling and suffering in a way that we are. All too often the media point the finger at black folks. You know, we lead the news no matter what city you're in. If it's inner city and it's poverty or crime, it's black pain that you see. And the question that the media never ask is why. And it's not just people outside of our race. Middle class, wealthy black people point the finger at black people who are not doing so well. So many black men working, walking on the backs of their heels in cities all across this country. Many of them veterans. The question that is never asked is why. You know, we don't know our history. We don't know what African Americans really have lived through. And I want to say that if we studied the truth of this history, of the nation's history in schools, those who survived as African Americans have 
would be honored. We, the question is not so much why, wouldn't be so much why so many of us are struggling mightily, which is why I'm doing this work. Why are so many struggling so mightily? And I just want to frame for you, and, and with bulleted, my husband, you all have to invite him back to speak, because Kefra is a scholar and encyclopedic and could run it down in such a beautiful way and talk about the stock market and that it really started right there on Wall Street, you know, to insure slaves. That's what gave birth to the stock market. And in college, I took a piece, I took a course on the stock market and I never learned that. So I just want to say this to you because I know tonight we have a gathering of conscious, committed people. And I want you to keep this history that is not taught in your heart so that when you see black children and children of color, but especially black children who are struggling, you know why, you know why. You know that post-slavery, there were slave patrols that, that grew up and chain gangs and the prison system. It was created as a way to what? To ensure that there would be free black labor still available after slavery. Black towns that were thriving and there were those in Tulsa and Atlanta, even Washington DC, Redwood, burned to the ground burned to the ground. There's a film about the burning of Tulsa. The Black Codes, you've heard of the Black Codes, but do you know what they did? They restricted African Americans from owning land, from starting businesses, and from even moving freely throughout the nation. Sometimes we had to have passes. In, 19, in 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson, you know, the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court decision made segregation and Jim Crow the official law of the land for 60 years. And there's so much more that I'm not gonna take you through, the poll taxes, literacy tests, the intimidation that kept black people away from the polls that we see today. It hurts my heart that I don't see this outcry about the, the marginalizing of black people at the polls and the diminishing of the black vote. This is really critical. We need to stand up for it vigorously. Banks redlining and Gutman's research research on aid to families with dependent children in the 1960s, what happened was it was mandated that in certain communities, namely ours, men were disallowed to be in any home that had a supplemental income from the government. And so Papa became a rolling stone. And welfare workers could come into your house actually and look through the medicine cabinet and in closets looking for men's paraphernalia. And so men moved on. And children were left defenseless with their mothers. And you can see in the 60s, you see the spike of single black mothers struggling to raise their families. Heroin in the 1950s, it chased me and my family out of Harlem. In the 1960s and 70s, you had a whole host of things happening to us. We had black power rising up, black people feeling proud of our color and our hair and our culture and history for the first time in this nation. In the 1980s, cocaine, cheap crack cocaine dumped into our communities. Nothing devastated black families more than the war on drugs, the war on drugs. Disproportionately targeting African American young people, sweeping them out of communities, away from their children. A children and, 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 and communities lost adults, they lost income, they lost wisdom, children were left defenseless. And what you see today, the children you see struggling today are really the offspring of many of those who were swept away into incarceration, coming home with felony charges and beginning that cycle of recidivation. Is that a word, Kev? Good, okay, glad I got it. I know you <laughs> You know, so young black lives, defenseless, but like RFK, we must know that we can do better, we can be better. I so want to sing and say America the Beautiful, it's possible. And the National Cares Mentoring Movement, like the Children's Action Corps, is rebuilding the village. That's what we're doing. You know, we as Americans, we have to remake ourselves, and we can do that. And so I'm going to take my seat, take my award, and I'm going to let this end with a very short video. It's two minutes, and you'll see our work. It's a testimony like you just saw you know, from, the, from RFK, that lives can be transformed. And I just ask you to keep 
the history, the history of African Americans and how we have struggled. I say very often, what would America be like if some outside Aaron Force came here and started siphoning off all of our young people over a period of 250 years, like what happened all along the coast of West Africa and even East Africa, which we don't know about, which left that continent vulnerable and certainly created the wealth that is America and the wealth that made this nation the wealthiest in the world and also that it created European empires. That's just the truth. It's our free labor and it needs to be acknowledged, it needs to be honored, and we need to fix this, and we can. The video, Tiante Miller, former gang leader from the south side of Chicago, who's transforming his life, his life. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tiante Miller, and I'm so proud to return to New York and talk with you all about Mama Susan, National Care's Mentoring Movement, and the Rising Program. I'm in debt to them for the rest of my life. When I was here last year, I talked about how the Rising helped me move from the street life and fell in school to graduating and going on to college. But I want to share something more personal with you about this program because my story is a story of so many diamonds in the rough out there. Diamond cares is helping polish. Before the Rising, the biggest dream I had for myself was to become a successful drug dealer. I was in gangs. I didn't know there was anything else I can do. And my story isn't unique. I'm standing here and I'm speaking for almost everybody I grew up with. Where I'm from in Chicago is tough. And my generation took a big hit. Many of my friends are incarcerated. Others are in gangs, some are dead. Most of us come up not having any idea that a life without gangs and violence was even possible. But the work the rising shows us otherwise. It shows us that life is possible. It showed me that I can make some other choices. That I didn't have to take penitentiary chance to become successful putting me in jail or in a casket. It helped me see that I'm a smart young man and could be a proud black man and it helps in my community if I was given a chance. <laughs> the Rising gave me a chance. It gave thousands of students in my city a chance. And in March, I will graduate with my associate's degree, which is the first step towards me doing all I can to make the health and the strength of my community possible. Every day I wake up grateful for Pastor Moss of Trinity United Church of Christ who I met through the rising, and my mentor, Caprice Radcliffe, who is here with me today. Caprice, stand up. I wake up in gratitude for Mama Susan and everybody who works at National Cares. Like Martin Luther King, who met with gangbangers on the South Side, the people at Cares meet with us on our block, and they bring love and hope, and they change lives. But most of all tonight, I came to say thank you. Your support saves lives. It saved my life. And together, if we choose to do what Mama Susan taught us, to never give up on the young people, we can save millions more. Thank you. Mama Susan. I mean, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Congratulations. You are truly remarkable. Truly. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. There are some other uh, past awardees with us tonight. I'd like to take a moment to let you know that they're here, and I'd like them to stand up as I say their names so that we can honor you again. Michael Connolly, Tom Corey, Judge Leslie Harris. Thaddeus Miles, Fran Sherman, Bob Watson, and Jerry Rice. Congratulations again to all of you, and thank you for being with us. There are some other people that I just would like to take a moment to, uh, to thank publicly because they put so much into this night. Um, special thanks to this year's Embracing the Legacy co-chairs and committee, John Boyle, Catherine Brady, Keith Carroll, Jim Garrity, Phil Johnston, Steve Peck, Joe Kennedy, and Matt Kennedy. So a huge round of applause for them, too. And you know what? And while you're clapping, let's hear it for the staff of this beautiful library who did a great job serving us tonight. Thank you to the wait staff. We hear about Congressman Kennedy a lot. 
As you know, he's got a remarkable brother who chooses not to be in the limelight, who chooses to do it quietly. I know that because I'm on the advisory board at RFK, and I know, as a board member, how many times we call on him. And with two children at home under the age of three and a full life, he's a very busy guy, but he's never too busy to participate in the things that you've heard about tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, I am very proud to be the one who introduces Matt Kennedy. Susan, should I be disappointed you didn't want to date me? <laughs> uh, th thank you all. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I really wanted to first, you know, congratulate um, all of our awardees. So, you know, Bill Little, Mama Susan, thank you all so much for everything that you guys do. Um, I also wanted to thank you, Jasmine, for coming up and sharing your story with us, because I think you know, it's your story for why we're all here. So we appreciate um, everything that you, you have done and the choices that you have made to, uh, to bring us all together today so that we can hopefully um, support other people to have, make the same choices that you make. Thank, thank you. Um, you know, it was funny, earlier tonight, while we were downstairs, we had the big crowd of people were around, and someone came up to me and said, hey, are you one of the Kennedys? And I said, yes. He said, are you Chris Kennedy? And I said, no, he's running for governor in Chicago. I said, well, are you Teddy Jr.? I said, no, he's a state senator from in, in Connecticut. He said, did you start a oil company? And I said, no, that's my father, Joe. <laughs> he said, are you the Congressman Kennedy? And I said, are you talking about my cousin Patrick or my brother Joe? <laughs> and I said, no, and he said, no, and then he sort of looked at me really befuddled and said, darn, I thought I was talking to an important person and left. Exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, when I uh, have an opportunity to speak um, at an event like this, um, you know, a, for an organization that honors um, my grandfather, uh, it always makes me pause. You know, I never met my grandfather. You know, and he's had such a big impact and emphasis on my life. And so preparing for a speech like this and to have the opportunity to speak to all of you, sometimes I find myself you know, going through some old clips or reading some old quotes to try to you know, get a sense of the man that he was and what I could say to make that make sense to you today or to bring guidance to our awardees. Um, you know, and while doing that today, I did that this afternoon, and one quote really stood out to me. Um, you know, my grandfather said that only those who dare to fail greatly can ever achieve greatly. You know, and our next awardee has done that. Donato Tremuto has dared to fail. You know, in business and in all of his philanthropic endeavors, he has always taken risks to push the envelope. You know, when he was the new CEO for his new company, he made the incredible and courageous decision. He actually, he paid another group to take a division of his company. He did that so that he could save hundreds of jobs. It's unheard of in the private sector to think that way. But he did it. You know, it's this courage and creativity to do so many, that has led him to so many professional accomplishments in the field of healthcare and healthy aging that many of you in this room are well aware of. You know, however, I think the thing that really drives Donato is his passion for serving others and for making the world more fair and more just for all of us. It's this compassion for others 
is the driving force by Donato's, b behind Donato's Foundation that over the past 15 years has helped hundreds of people meet their health care and educational needs. He's never content with what is. With what is. He, he sees problems and he tries to solve them. You know, just last night, the, Donato, the Trumato Foundation presented two Two, scholars, uh, two college scholarships to high school graduates who both recently lost a parent and could not afford to attend college. <laughs> two weeks ago, he gave two additional scholarships to deserving graduates from Bangor, Maine. One had emigrated last year from Nigeria and will be enrolled in a pre-pharmacy program. The other, whose father is disabled and can no longer work, will be studying business logistics at Mass Maritime Academy. <laughs> Any of the RFK graduates, if you haven't gone to college yet, Donato's in the front row. <laughs> uh, you know, Donato's other nonprofit, Healthy Villages, has partnered with the RFK Human Rights to expand access to high quality health care in the most remote regions of the United States and throughout the world. You know, Donato's work is far from done. So on behalf of the RFK Children's Action Corps, my family, I'm pleased to present the Embracing a Legacy Award to our great friend, Donato Tremuda. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Board Vice Chair, Catherine Brady. <laughs> the, uh, the great poet and human rights activist, my hero, Maya Angelou once said, everything in the universe has rhythm Everything dances, and tonight I feel like I'm dancing with the stars. Ed Kelly, President Klein, Congressman Joe Kennedy, and Matt Kennedy. Tonight's other honorees, my family, my Tivity Health family, friends, and my life partner, Jeff, of 25 years, tomorrow night. I am humbled and honored by this award. However, I am reminded of the words of Senator Kennedy when he said, quote, each time we stand up for others or work to improve the lots we send forth a tiny ripple of hope, and that ripple builds a current that can sweep away the mightiest walls of resistance and oppression. I am proud to accept this honor in behalf of many passionate people who have worked in the Tremuto Foundation and who have created powerful ripples through our work at Healthy Villages. But I accept this award not for what has been achieved and rather for what still needs to be accomplished. And therefore, I'm happy to bring forward this evening good news from the front lines. Our ripples are expanding. We're providing more scholarships to high school graduates whose hope for the future we embrace. We're mentoring those students with a willingness to share our own stories by embracing our own vulnerabilities. We're supporting young people with challenges to pursue their educational dreams. And tonight, I'm honored to have one of our scholars here from the Tremuto Foundation 
who, despite living in multiple foster homes, found one where he was able to get love and hope and just graduated from Babson College a few weeks ago. <laughs> Sam, Sam LaPointe. <laughs> Senator Kennedy put it so eloquently that perhaps this world is a world in which children suffer, but we can lessen the number of suffering children. I like to think that our collective efforts has done something to lessen that suffering. Just recently, Healthy Villages and the Tremuto Foundation committed to a five-year grant, a comprehensive nutritional program to reduce pediatric mortality. In a small village in Lawala, pediatric mortality still has 28 children per 1,000 dying. That is unfair. We've already reduced infant mortality in that region from 100 deaths per 1,000 births down to 30. 70 more babies are alive because of healthy villages. From our corner of the world, we are proud to serve Senator Kennedy's enormous global standards of humanity and passion to do good for others. And why? The disgraceful reality is that in our lifetime, one billion people will go to their graves prematurely because they did not have access to a health care worker. Some people have said to me, Donato, that's not our problem. I disagree. Article 25 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states that health care is a basic right for every single person. <laughs> and when one person has not had that access, we have violated the declaration. We draw much of our passion to fight the injustice from the transformative leadership of Senator Kennedy. He has surely been a lifelong hero of mine. As a small child at the age of eight, I lost my hearing. And for nearly 10 years, I struggled, bullied, and made fun of by peers, by classmates, and by family. During those years when I was bullied and denied the right to be heard, I entered into the quietude of an intellectual curiosity that was fueled by Senator Kennedy's writings. His example of perseverance and his writings of moral leadership helped fill those difficult years. They inspired me last year to write a book published by the title, Life's Bulldozer Moments how adversity can lead to success in life and business. One of the most powerful examples of Senator Kennedy's leadership was his work on rural poverty. Five decades ago, doctors surveying the poorest regions of the American South found third world conditions, including diseases long thought to have been eradicated, even among children. The senator, in typical fashion, took this cause as his own. In 1968, he held a congressional hearing in eastern Kentucky. He invited television cameras to follow him from house to house. Americans began to share his moral outrage. He stated clearly, if you want change, you must be angry enough to make change happen. Yet. He also brought hope. That legacy endures even more so today and reminds me of the great educator, Horace Mann, who once said, be ashamed to die until you have won some victory for humanity. It's a fitting quote to honor the memory of Senator Robert F. Kennedy and to recognize the incredible efforts of those gathered here this evening. 
I am honored and grateful to be with all of you in solidarity of our shared cause. Your work, our work is never done. Our dreams are yet to be realized. Our mission should never be to simply survive. We must continue to win victories for all people. Let's continue together to expand those ripples of hope for humanity. For it is, in my mind, our last best hope for a more just and fair world. Thank you. Welcome Board Vice Chair, Catherine Brady. Hi everyone, I'm Catherine, not Donato. But boy, to be that accomplished. Um, as a Vice Chair of the Board, I'd like to thank you all for being here and for all that you have done to help our children. To our honorees, Donato Tremuto, Susan Taylor, and Bill Little, you inspire us and you compel us to continue this work. You are proof that one individual action can and does make a difference in this world. We are fortunate to count you among the fiercest advocates for children. Thank you. As you've heard repeatedly tonight, children deserve a childhood. And we hope that you leave inspired by our honorees, by having seen our alumni and the real life impact of this work. We ask that you commit yourselves to take one action to improve the life of a child, whatever that might be. And when you do, think of Jasmine and of all the children who can make it. And as we close, we're going to leave you with some photos from the past year at RFK Children's Action Corps. We have a Facebook page for those of you who are social media users, go check it out. And these photos remind us of the courage and bravery of the youth that we serve and of the staff and volunteers who give them a voice and give them hope. We look forward to seeing you again next year. Thank you. Turn a phrase into a weapon or a drug. You can be the outcast or be the backlash of somebody's lack of love. Or you can start speaking up. Nothing's gonna hurt you the way the words do when they settle beneath your skin. Kept in the inside with no sunlight, sometimes the shadow wins. I wonder what would happen if you say what you want to say and let the words fall out. Honestly, I want to say you'll be brave with what you want to say and let the words fall out. Honestly, I want to say you'll be brave. Just want to see you. I just want to see you. Everybody's been stared down by the enemy Falling from the fear and don't seem disappearing Bow down to the mighty Don't run Stop holding your tongue Maybe there's a way out of the cage where you live Maybe one of these days you could let the light in And show me how big your brave is what you want to say and 
should tell them the truth. Say what you want to say and let